Well, it's seven o'clock on the dot here, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome everybody um, to CRS Virtual Education. Um, in conjunction with ASKERS Young Surgeons Committee tonight, we will be doing mock oral boards uh, without further ado. So we'll go ahead and get started to keep things uh, going on time. But first, a uh, brief uh, introduction for our examiners. Um, first up, we have Dr. Cusick, who completed her undergraduate degree at Georgia Institute of Technology and medical school at Morehouse School of Medicine, residency at uh, UAB Birmingham, and a master's in public health during her training. She uh, finished out her training at uh, University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston um, for her uh, colorectal fellowship and is in faculty at Houston. So she'll be doing our first um, exam this evening um, and getting started with, uh, let's see, my pairings here are with Dr. Uh, Karigatla. So take it away, you've got 23 minutes. All right. So you are called to see um, an inpatient uh, on the medicine service. She's a 27-year-old woman with a history of Crohn's disease that um, has had on again, off again um, exacerbations, but she's admitted as of yesterday with an acute exacerbation of her Crohn's disease. Um, she's been admitted to the hospitalist. GI hasn't quite seen her yet, um, but she has started uh, steroids. They started her on... Um, on solumedrol, 40 milligrams IV daily. Um, she was diagnosed with her Crohn's disease about a year ago. She's been on and off again taking mesalamine, but not very consistently. She has seen her primary care and urgent care several times um, since she was diagnosed and, and just given steroids on and off. Um, <clears throat> she was admitted yesterday and she had some low grade fevers, um, about 100. She had some leukocytosis with a white count of 15 when she came in, some nausea, um, emesis, some abdominal pain, crampy. Um, that's over the last four weeks has gotten a bit worse. Nothing that is, you know, excruciating, but it's just kind of been building to the point where she's um, not been eating very much. And over the last six months or so has had about a 15 pound weight loss. Um, since she was admitted or since she was seen in the ER and admitted yesterday, um, she had an NG2 placed and she feels a little bit better with that, but she's had about 1,500 to 2,000 out of her NG tube um, since it was placed about 24 hours ago. Um, so you're, you're on your way to see her. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so um, first thing I'll do is I'll go see the patient and talk to the patient. Um, uh, I'll also ask her about you know, any prior surgical history. She's never had any surgery. When you're going down to see her, you go down, um, you look at her vital signs. She is uh, mildly tachycardic with a heart rate of 105. She's, um, her blood pressure is stable at 120s over 75. Um, her respiratory rate is 15. She is um, sat in comfortably on, on room air. Uh, in review, you also see uh, and evaluate her labs um, from her leukocytosis of 15 when she came in, repeats to say, white blood cell count of 13, hemoglobin of eight, uh, creatinine is 0 0.7 and albumin of uh, 2.4. Her CRP is around 100 or as 100, excuse me. Um, as in regards to surgical history, she's never had any abdominal surgery. She's had tonsil surgery when she was a child. Um, she did have a colonoscopy and that was at the time of her Crohn's diagnosis. And at that point there was some inflammation within the terminal ileum. Okay, so I think I have pretty much uh, most of the history that I would like. Um, so I'd go ahead and do an uh, abdominal physical uh, physical exam, focusing on an abdominal exam. Yeah, so she's uh, mildly distended. She's somewhat tender, um, but she reports it's much better since yesterday after the ND tube was placed. Okay, so um, uh, I will also go ahead and if it hasn't already been done, so I'd also go ahead and order a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast. Okay. So you do a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast. There's noted to be some thickening of the small bowel um, into the terminal ileum and there's small bowel dilation through the entirety of the um, abdomen. The colon is generally decompressed. Um, there is an NG tube in place. There's um, normal kidneys, no concern for um, air in the bladder, no evidence of um, air in the, in the vagina or the bladder. The liver is normal. 
Okay, so um, in terms of moving forward, um, I'll uh, counsel the patient on what has happened so far and what's her likely course moving forward. Either uh, she responds to medical therapy and we can avoid surgery or, you know, given her history, I, I am concerned that she may end up needing an operative um, treatment in this admission. Uh, but in, as of now, there is nothing emergent pushing me to um, uh, take her to the operating room. So I will start her on uh, um, uh, total parenteral nutrition, uh, given her mal uh, malnourishment. Um, and um, I'll also continue to monitor her um, with serial abdominal exams. Um, and then I'll also make sure that GI also sees her and sees if there's any other input that they can also provide. Okay. So she continues on her solumedrol. She gets, uh, she starts PPN, transition to TPN after a couple of days. You're four days in, no change. Okay, so um, since we're, G sorry, go ahead. G excuse me, NG tube is still between um, 1,500 and, and 2,000. Um, she's not complaining of any more pain. She's walking like it's going out of style. Um, she's doing everything that she's supposed to do. But in, in general, she says no gas, no bowel movement. Um, she's status quo for the last four days. So I'm worried that she's uh, um, not responding to medical management uh, with her Crohn's <clears throat> stricture. Um, so I will counsel the patient that she'll likely need um, that she we should plan for an operative intervention uh, in the form of a, um, a ileocolic resection with an end um, ileostomy. In preparation for surgery, I'll also order a CT enterography or MR enterography, whatever is available at the um, at, at my institution. Okay. So you go ahead and order the CT um, enterography and um, they, they do the CT, no significant findings other than the uh, small bowel is significantly distended. She vomits around her NG tube um, three times after having to drink the contrast load. Um, when they put it back to suction, they get all the contrast back out. Um, there's still small bowel distension, significant thickening within the terminal ileum. There is no, um, no significant stool burden within the colon. Okay, so I'll go ahead, um, uh, take her to the operating room for a laparoscopic um, ileocolic resection. Um, if urology is available, I'll also have them place um, uh, ureteral stents, uh, at least on the right side. Her last words to you before she rolls back to the operating room is, please don't give me an ostomy. So um, I will talk to her and I will, like I said, I'll counsel her saying that, you know, um, because of her chronic steroid use or her, uh, her nu um, nutrition status, um, that I would uh, definitely have to give her an ostomy because of the high uh, complication risk of a, of a leak. Um, uh, I will also mark her for an ostomy as well. I'll also have her meet with the ostomy team so that she can also get some preoperative counseling on, on, uh, uh, on, st on a stoma. Okay. So uh, when do you want to take her to the operating room? Um, as soon as she's marked and we have urology on board um, uh, and we just finished the CTE. So within the next 24 to 48 hours. Okay. So you take her to the operating room. Tell me about her positioning and any other preoperative um, workup or evaluation you'd like. Yeah, so under general anesthesia, I would have her in a lithotomy position. Um, I'll make sure that she's marked for an ostomy. Uh, I'll have urology place a stent on the right side, um, a ureteral stent on the right side. Um, and then I'll go ahead, um, you know, place appropriate laparoscopic ports. Uh, once I gain, uh, gain access into the abdomen, I'll start off by um, uh, mobilizing the TI um, as well as the right colon um, and cecum. Um, and obviously taking care, making sure not to injure um, the ureter, identifying the ureter uh, as well, um, if I can. Um, and then uh, once I do that, then um, I'll go ahead, once I have adequate mobilization, I'll make, I'll make a mini uh, midline laparotomy, deliver the um, uh, ileocolic segment outside. At this time, I'll also um, manually palpate the remainder of the small intestine to make sure there's no other areas of disease. Um, and then once I localize the disease, I'll go ahead, uh, resect that portion and then pull up an ostomy with an endoleostomy. Okay. So you, you get in, you see severe stenosis of the TI, proximal, uh, small bowel significantly distended. Um, but does it show any evidence of the, only the last 10 centimeters shows evidence of creeping fat with thickened mesentery. How do you address the mesentery in your procedure? Hey, Dr. Merced. Hey, how did it go? It was good. It was good. They did good questions and they were very interesting. So it was nice. Ross, Amy. Jonathan, Just a reminder uh, for everybody there. who is uh, not Dr. Cusick or Dr. Kandigatla to mute your mics, please. 
sorry about that. So uh, you get in, you get into the abdomen, the last 10 centimeters are significantly dilated and uh, the remainder is um, healthy appearing. Um, how do you address the mesentery? Um, so I will go ahead and resect the small bowel um, close to the edge of the mesentery um, and, uh, um, and pull up an ostomy. Uh, I'll make sure that I um, oversew the edge of the mesentery to help prevent um, complications such as bleeding. Okay. So you, you bring up her ostomy and um, everything goes well. You finish up her surgery and uh, she's post-op day one. You go and see her, her hemoglobin beforehand was eight. She's down to seven. She's mildly tachycardic. Her heart rate's uh, 110. Her blood pressure is 90 over 60. Okay. Um, uh, so I'll go ahead and examine the patient. I'll do an abdominal exam. Uh, I will also, given her low hemoglobin and her um, symptomatic anemia, I'll go ahead and transfuse uh, uh, two units of blood for her. Okay. You give her the two units of blood. You're gone back to your office to check on your clinic patients, and you get a call that she's now tachycardic into the 140s. <clears throat> her blood pressure is now 80s over 60. She's got her second unit of blood in. Okay, so um, given that she's uh, now, I'm really concerned for uh, bleeding um, as a complication. So I would go talk to the patient and I would also um, counsel her on what's going on and my concern for bleeding. And I would take her to the operating room to perform an exploratory laparotomy uh, to find a um, source of bleeding. All right, um, you get into the operating room, you open her up, you see about 600 um, cc's of blood and you see a pulsatile bleeding coming from the mesentery. Okay, so I'd go ahead, um, you know, pack the abdomen and slowly uh, take out the packs. And once I find the source of the mesentery, I'd go ahead and oversew it, um, if I can, um, with uh, absorbable suture. Okay. Um, anything else you want to do in, in regards to the remainder of the cut edge of the mesentery, or you're just identifying that isolated bleeder and tying it off? No, I would um, go ahead and make sure that it's hemostatic. Um, given my concern, I would also um, uh, place hemostatic agents as, such as uh, surgical or um, uh, abret, um, uh, over the edge. Um, and uh, I would normally take this with a ligature device. So, um, uh, and then I would you know, examine the edge of the mesentery. Uh, and if there's any areas of bleeding, um, oversew it uh, with uh, vicral or absorbable suture. Okay. Um, she recovers well and is now post-operative. She does the remainder of her recovery without any incident. She's eating, she's drinking, and you see her back uh, two weeks in the office and she's already asking you when her ostomy is gonna get closed. Yeah, so um, uh, I would explain to her that the first priority would be for her to recover from the surgery, including her um, nutritional status. Uh, so we'll keep um, uh, making sure that she's able to intake an adequate amount of nutrition. She's able to gain some of her weight back. Um, at the same time, uh, we'll also talk with gastroenterology to um, uh, have her get started on um, uh, treatment for Crohn's disease to help prevent a future recurrence. And then um, typically about six months um, is how long I'd want to wait at least before. And once she meets all these parameters, then I would go ahead and proceed with a um, uh, take back uh, or a ileostomy takedown. And in doing so, do you do, uh, what, when do you want to restart her mesalamine or is it, are you going to encourage her to um, consider something different? So mesalamine, she can start um, as soon as she's discharged. Um, and I would also consider um, start um, biologic therapy as well, um, typically about three to four weeks after her surgery. Okay. So she's fine with that. She gets in with her GI. She's very concerned about the cost of the biologics, but she says she'll, she'll do her best to get all that taken care of. Um, rewind to you're in the operating room the first time, all right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're in the operating room the first time. You identify that the terminal ileum is densely adherent to the sigmoid colon. Um, didn't see it preoperatively. You looked at it. You notice that there was a fat plane there, but when you get in, reality is just quite different. Um, it is very stuck to the rectosigmoid junction, um, and there you are. It's the, still the most distal 10 centimeters, but instead of it being freely mo uh, being able to mobilize it, it's, it's, it's stuck to the rectosigmoid. How, how would you handle this? 
So at this point, I'd be concerned that there may also be a focus of uh, Crohn's disease in the sigmoid as well. Um, while the patient is in the operating room and in lithotomy position, I'll go ahead and do a flexible sigmoidoscopy to examine that area to make sure that there's no, um, if it's just a fistula or if the sigmoid is kind of a bystander or if it also has active colitis. Okay, so you're fortunate you have her in lithotomy position and you're able to put a scope in, you put the scope in and there's a very, very dry mucosa. You're able to navigate up to um, the recto-sigmoid junction. Um, you see an acute angulation and your colon is filling up with air as you're scoping. Um, you do not see any active full thickness, Crohn's disease, any inflammation, any evidence of fistula in this area of the sigmoid colon. Okay, so um, I will go ahead and try to uh, resect um, uh, or separate the uh, terminal ileum from the rectosigmoid. Um, and if I'm able to do so cleanly without any damage to the rectosigmoid, then uh, that's good. If not, then I will go ahead and do a primary repair. Um, and if uh, there's a considerable, a significant colotomy made, then I would go ahead and do a segmental resection of the rectosigmoid. Okay, so you're able to um, laparoscopically kind of tease them apart. Um, it's pretty beat up and, and somewhat bloody in the area, but you don't see any full thickness um, injury and um, you don't see any evidence of a, of a fistula or communication once you take that dissection down. Um, would it change how you're gonna handle the rest of the procedure that you had done before? Um, I would, all, I would, you know, uh, just to confirm that I did not have any injury to the recto sigmoid, I would go ahead and do an air leak test, um, uh, make sure there isn't a hole that I can find. Uh, but in terms of the rest of the operation, I would still go ahead and do an um, endoleostomy at that point. Okay. You are called, or you're in your office, you're seeing a 47-year-old woman um, who reports she's had a six-week history of anal pain with bright red um, blood in her stools. She says before that, she's been totally fine, never had any abnormalities. Six weeks ago, she came back from vacation um, and she's been having this intense pain with bowel movements. Um, she says it lasts for hours after every bowel movement. She says it's bright red on the toilet paper with most bowel movements since this started. Um, she has no history of uh, anything similar to this. Her bowel movements are typically soft, um, but sometimes can be harder, especially when she's traveling or on vacation. Um, right now, she's actually like scared to have bowel movements. She's been able, she's been missing work. She's not able to um, be comfortable for a couple hours afterwards. She's never had a colonoscopy. She's um, she's married. She has a child 12 years ago with a grade two tear that was repaired without any complications. No family history of uh, inflammatory bowel disease or uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, sorry, how old was she again? 60? 47. 47. Okay. Um, and uh, sorry, you said you, uh, she has not had a colonoscopy before? That's correct. Okay. So um, I have most of the history that I would need. Um, uh, what I'm concerned about um, is a few things. So I would go ahead um, while I'm in the hospital, uh, while in the clinic, I would go ahead and do an um an exam, uh, including an anorectal exam with, um, uh, I would start off with an external exam first to see what I can find. And then depending on what she can tolerate, then I would move forward with the additional rectal exam and endoscopy if she can tolerate it. Okay. Um, what positioning would you have her in? Yeah. So I'd have her in a prone jackknife position. Okay. In prone jackknife position, she's very apprehensive to you doing any kind of exam, um, clenching her buttocks muscles but you're able to do an external exam and you see a uh, inflamed posterior skin tag. Okay, um, and uh, um, uh, am I able to face the anus at all to identify a fissure possibly or? You attempt to do that, but you don't really, you're not able to see much. You think you see kind of the, the very distal aspect of, a, of an anal fissure. Okay. So at this point, I'm concerned, obviously, my um, is uh, uh, for an anal fissure, um, and her um, clinical history seems to match with that. So I would counsel her on uh, uh, bulking agents such as um, fiber uh, or metamucil, um, uh, fiber supplements and a high fiber diet, as well as stool softeners to help her um, prevent constipation or hard stools, um, sits baths as well. Um, and then uh, given that it's been six weeks since her symptoms started, I'll also get her started on a diltazem ointment, um, a topical ointment, and I would see her back in six weeks. Okay. Um, do you know the dosing of the ointment? 
it's a 2% uh, um, ointment uh, compounded, and it's to be used uh, at least twice a day, a pea sized okay. amount uh, twice a day. Okay. So she starts using that um, in addition to avoiding the complication or the constipation, excuse me, drinking more water. Um, she returns to you about six weeks later and she reports that she's generally feeling better. Okay. So um, if she's feeling better at this time, I'd go. I'd uh, like to go ahead and do a full um, uh, exam, um, including it with digital rectal exam as well as an endoscopy. Okay, so you do the digital rectal exam. Um, you feel an increased uh, sphincter tone with some kind of spasming and quivering of the anal canal. Um, you don't feel any palpable mass or any significant um, uh, hard stool burden within the distal rectum. You're able to use to do an anoscopy. On an anoscopy, you see a uh, posterior anal fissure that's partially healed. It's um, now it's it's shallow. There's still a sentinel pile and an inflammatory skin tag distal. Okay, so um, I would uh, advise, uh, um, I'd inform the patient that, you know, her symptoms are getting better. Her exam also indicates that she has a fissure that is healing as well. Um, so I would have her continue the conservative life, um, uh, lifestyle uh, measures in terms of the high fiber, high water, sits baths as needed, avoiding constipation. Um, I'd also uh, tell her to continue using the topical diltiazem until her symptoms completely resolve. And then I would also make sure that the patient has a colonoscopy scheduled. Okay. So um, three months later, she comes, she does a colonoscopy, nothing, nothing abnormal, all good, checks out clear. Um, three months later, she comes back, same exact symptoms. She started using the ointment this time, and she's not better after using it now for six weeks. Okay, so um, I would go ahead uh, uh, with a, um, I'd talk to the patient, and I'd go ahead with an exam under anesthesia. Um, uh, assuming that I'm not able to, uh, if I'm not able to do a proper exam in the clinic um, because of the same symptoms. Um, if not, then I'd go ahead with an exam under anesthesia. Exam under anesthesia, you see the same thing that you saw on your um, evaluation after she has started the diltiazem, except now the fissure is quite deep. You see the underlying um, sphincter muscle. Um, there's no rolled edges or inflammatory um, concerns around the fissure. It, it is an isolated posterior midline fissure. Yeah, at this time, I would still go ahead and uh, take some biopsies of the fissure site, um, as well as some normal uh, tissue surrounding it. And then, um, uh, and then I would see her back in the clinic. What? Everything comes back normal. Everything comes back do? normal. Yeah. So at this point, I've talked biopsies to the are normal pain still the same. Yeah, so I would Actually, talk to the after the biopsies. <laughs> sure. um, I would talk to the patient about um, what options she can try moving forward, including um, uh, Botox injection. Um, and if the patient is uh, amenable for Botox injection, the other option would be a lateral internal sphincterotomy. Um, I'd explain to the patient that, you know, the risks and benefits of each um, uh, method with the Botox being a uh, lower chance of incontinence, but um, uh, symptoms would be temporary given the temporary nature of the Botox with lateral internal sphincterotomy being a more effective uh, method for preventing recurrence, but obviously a higher chance of incontinence that it would be permanent. Just a two minute warning. Okay, so she says, you fix me once, fix me again. Okay, so- um, Sorry, what, what was it? I, she said, you fixed me once with this fissure, I trust you, do whatever you, I'll do whatever you tell me to. Okay, so in that case, um, I would go ahead um, uh, with a Botox injection. So exam under anesthesia with a Botox injection. Walk me through how you do that. Yeah, so I'd have the patient in prone jackknife position. Um, uh, once I do that, once I have the um, retractor in the uh, anus and expose this, uh, the sphincter, um, as well as the fissure, I would draw up 100 units of uh, Botox uh, into one cc of uh, normal saline and I would inject 50 units um, on either side of the fissure directly into the internal sphincter muscle. You're back in your office after you've done your anal rectal cases for the day. And you get a call from, from her husband that she has pooped all over his car. Okay. So, um, you know, I would, I would uh, have the patient see me in clinic um, as soon as she can. 
Um, I've talked to the patient on the phone as well, make sure there's no other issues, um, concerns, but if she can make it wait till the clinic, I'd have her see uh, me in clinic. And, um, uh, and I would explain to her that, you know, this is a very likely side effect, not very likely, but this is very likely to be secondary from her um, Botox injection. Uh, so I would um, have her start her on high do um, uh, extra fiber bulking agents, as well as um, antidiarrheal agents such as Imodium uh, to see if that can uh, improve her symptoms. Okay. I think I'll stop there because I think we're pretty close to time. Um, are we doing an evaluation now or, or at the conclusion? Yes, we'll do a couple minutes now if you uh, would be so kind as to give feedback. And then at the end, we'll just wrap up with uh, closing thoughts. Yeah, so um, I, th I thought you handled both scenarios very well. So you stayed calm, you. you were focused, you had good eye contact throughout the entirety of um, the examination. Um, I think that you're, you, you knew a plan, but weren't like too far in the weeds to be able to see a curveball coming. Um, a couple of things that I would say from the Crohn's disease case. Number one was, um, I know I harp on my fellows, don't ever present to me a Crohn's disease without looking at their bottom, right? because it can give you a little bit of insight if they're going to have fistulizing disease. And I see some of my former fellows on here and, and they'll, they'll vouch to that, that, um, and I know you probably, you know, would have done that, but you didn't say it. And I didn't give it to you either. Yeah, right. Like yeah. you said, exam, I didn't give it to you. Um, and again, I know you would have done it, but I don't know you're going to do it unless you said it. Right. Um, other things that, um, I kind of gave you all the pre you know, the pretext of having a um, a nutritionally deplete patient, um, but there's probably a little bit more lab work that you could have done, right, to confirm that, to really help uh, solidify your decision of making an ileostomy, right? So you got an, uh, I think I gave you an albumin one time, which 2. was 2.4. Right? I know you had the yeah. 15 pound weight loss and all this, and I don't disagree with you, but if the pay, you know, just, you could have gotten a little bit more information in regards to um, her amount of, of uh, nutrition or her nutritional status and evaluation to make a determination for ileostomy. And I think that's the right thing. That's the safe thing, right? Um, I, it could have gone either way. You could have done ileocolic resection if, you know, what if you got her pre-albumin up to 20 during the week or whatever that she was getting TPN, would that have changed your mind of doing an anastomosis? Uh, maybe not, right? So I do think um, lithotomy was good. Um, you got, I, I don't know if the CT interrography really added anything because she, it's an instructed patient, right? And yeah. so that's a pretty, that's a pretty tough exam to do on a patient. I mean, I don't think it's, I'm not going to fault you for doing that. Did it change your management? No, no, no right? I think I, it's sort of my usually go to for, I guess it's better for patients that have had previous surgical resections or multifocal or a concern for multifocal. I guess in this patient, yeah, I, it, yeah, I think it would, it was an unnecessary test. Yeah. I, and I don't think it, I'm not going to fault you for it. There's no like critical fail associated with doing that test, but I don't know, really know if it added anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, the one thing um, in regards to management of Crohn's disease Make sure that if somebody, like I obviously gave you the mesenteric bleeder because you took the bowel right at the mesentery and bowel junction. And I told you that bowel, that mesentery is very thickened, right? So if you're going right there at the bowel mesentery junction and you're using a ligature or whatever, um, that's high risk for bleeding there, right? So you may want to just a little clause of what you would probably do in the operating room, you know, try to transect the mesentery where it's soft, pliable, where you can confirm um, good hemostatic control. So sure. um, that was the Crohn's case. In regards to the anal fissure case, um, I didn't have any, I didn't have any concerns, didn't have any um, reservations. Um, I think the sooner you said, what's her age? Has she ever has said a, had a colonoscopy? Just go ahead and blurt it out then. Like, patient needs a colonoscopy because they may take you around to abscesses and fistulas and all that kind of stuff. But once you've said it, like examiner, like there's a checkbox. Okay. Colonoscopy, done, you know, and then, and then you're done with that. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you were thinking it. Um, it was just, you said it at an appropriate time, which is fine. Um, and I agree with you. Maybe you wouldn't do a colonoscopy, you know, right away at your initial, um, 
you know, anal evaluation. But if you set it, then you're, you've got it marked off and you're not going to get distracted from that later. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Perfect. That's the only evaluation or suggestions I had. Good job. Thank you. We do have a question in the comments um, from somebody who's viewing. Um, would you bring up a, uh, a lateral internal sphincterotomy in a woman with a prior episiotomy? Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where I was going with the incontinence episodes kind of afterwards. Um, and if there would have been a choice for, for doing a, a lateral internal sphincterotomy, um, yes, you have to know the number that you're going to quote a patient, have it ready for the examiners of what you're going to say and have it be backed up by data um, on how, what, a, what are you going to quote them as their incontinence. Um, I did give you the information that she'd had a, a repair, but that she'd had no evidence of fecal incontinence in the past. Um, yes, you be expected for that when you have a Fisher case, especially in a, you know, not a young woman, but a woman that's had um, children vaginal deliveries in the past, be ready to answer that question and how you're going to manage it. And if they don't give you the information, ask. That's exactly what I was going to say. They may not give you that, that, that uh, obstetric inf uh, uh, history. You have to ask it. Um, she, Dr. Susan was nice because uh, when you listed off the, the, the dose, the I was like, okay, where's the question is, oh, patient calls back, has a headache, wants an ephedipine. <laughs> all right. They will ask you that. On a fissure question, no, deltiazem, ephedipine, nitro, all the, the, the strengths ready to go because they will ask you. Um, they will be that specific. Um, the only comment I had on the Crohn's, when you're for the right colon, you're doing the other colic resection, you said ureter, 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 also duodenum. They will get you with that. Duo. Duo. Because right ureter, yeah, it's it's good to think about it, but really you're, you're not on the left side where the, yeah, the, where the left ureter is much higher risk. On the right side, it's the duo. And especially, you know, Dr. Suggs is telling you that the mesentery is in, involved. You may have to go down. Soft mesentery right might, might be at your ileocolic takeoff. So you have to be wary, you know, path to duodenum down, be on the lookout for it. You have to mention it. Because Good point. If, if Thank you, you were, for bringing that up. Yeah, if you were practicing with, with with me, I would have been like, okay, post up day two. Let's say you left the drain in, now it turns green because you think yeah. you do it or something. Yeah. I, I I would have tossed it back to you because that's and that's honestly the best way to practice for this is what we're doing right now with a group of co fellows buddies to just go over scenarios over scenarios over scenarios. And you know we we would do it to try to mess each other up a little bit, okay? Because you never know what they'll ask you. You never know. But yeah. Other than that, I thought you did very well. Just when when you get thrown a curveball breathe a second because sometimes you would go right into it and you would kind of fumble on your words a little bit take a breath it's okay you have a lot more time than you think you can take a five second breather all right all right Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time and the feedback great um and so with that we'll transition thank you uh dr cusick and dr Kandeglatla. uh we really appreciate your participation um, next up, we'll have uh, Dr. Califel, who uh, completed his undergraduate education at FIU and his medical school at Ross University. He uh, completed general surgery residency at the University of Connecticut and colorectal fellowship at Lehigh Valley. Um, he's currently on faculty at Baptist Health of South Florida and will be uh, administering an exam to Dr. King. So uh, take it away. All right. I say I don't see him yet. He was on earlier. Let me try to message him again. Did he get scared? Did we scare him? While we're waiting for um, him to join back, I think it's just important to give a, a couple of pointers from um, when I like to practice with my um, graduates and my fellows. Number one, um, they're not gonna try to give you something that is just, you've never heard of, right? They're gonna give you something that you've probably seen and it's just kind of masked into uh, because of something else. So 
Um, do your evaluation like you will do it. Um, when you see that patient, turning it into a patient that you've seen and taking care of them like a patient you've already taken care of. And then also, you know, turn it into an operation that you'd feel safe with dictating into, you know, your operative dictation. Um, just talk through that step by step like you would if you're, you know, taking a trauma patient back to the operating room and um, how are you going to do it system systematically and, and thoroughly and making sure you identify the right pathology. Um, and then if you do forget something, it's okay. You have that entire time during that question block to answer the question. So if you say, you know what, I was totally off. I didn't mean that I was going to give them uh, alprazolam, you know, compound anointment. I meant diltiazam and, and that's what I meant, you know, just whatever. And just say, you know what, that, that's what I meant. I, I just kind of got lost in those words, but diltiazam, yep, that's what I meant. And, and this is the dose. And so just take that opportunity to correct yourself and, um, and to kind of take that, take that breather, um, like Dr. Kelfell was saying, take that breather and, and just kind of get yourself back together and answer the questions. I think our prize on ointment would be awesome for some patients. Let me tell you that. <laughs> it's like, shh, quiet now. Um, Dr. King is having some technical difficulties. He's on vacation in a rural area right now. So actually, thankfully, Dr. Uh, Kandagatla has offered to suffer through yet another exam for all of our benefit. Thank I you. Mean, someone else much. wants to go, like someone else wants to step up. I mean, but if he wants to, hey, good. Or good if somebody else would. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'll get you started. Let me see to make sure that I'm looking right at him. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Take a breath. Breath. I say this to every time I do practices with everybody. We're two colleagues having a discussion in the surgeon's lounge after a nice day of surgery. You got a cup of coffee. I got a cup of coffee. All right. So you have a 55-year-old male that the emergency room gives you a call about. States patient comes in with a two-day history of abdominal pain, bloating, um, and just distended. Um, is not feeling well. Right now, vital signs are stable. Um, they're pending a CT scan, but they want to just give you a heads up just because they're a little concerned about this patient. Okay. So, um, I will go ahead and, uh, uh, see the patient, talk to the patient, get a um, history, uh, in terms of, um, you know, prior history of similar symptoms, um, yeah, prior history of colonoscopies, prior history of surgeries, as well as prior history of personal history of malignancies or family history of malignancies. Um, as well as other symptoms such as weight loss or bleeding per rectum that they may have experienced in the past few months. So he tells you that he's noticed some, uh, not bleeding, but kind of like dark colored stool, stools for the last like six months. Weight loss hasn't really noticed much. He's a guy that doesn't really take care of himself. Never really goes to doctors, no medications. Has told you he's had a belly button hernia surgery before when he was a kid. Um, no history of colonoscopy. Says uh, dad, dad passed away of what he thinks was colon cancer in his 60s but really not too sure of anything else. No smoking history, no other pertinent history to your exam. Okay, so what else would you want to do with the patient? Um, so also uh, get um, uh, vitals on the patient, um, as well as move forward with the um, physical exam, including an abdominal exam, as well as a digital rectal exam. Okay, so uh, vital signs are stable. Um, you just noted that he just doesn't feel well. On exam, um, he's distended. He is tympanic. Um, he is tender on the left side um, of the abdomen, kind of a mid-abdomen. Um, not guarding, not rebounding, not peritonic, but he's tender. Okay, digital rectal exam, you don't, uh, you don't notice any, any change and you see no blood on exam. Okay, so I'll go ahead and move forward with ordering some labs, including a CBC, a BMP, um, a lactate, uh, as well as um, an albumin, pre-albumin. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll start with those labs for now. Okay. Those are already cooking by the ED. They did that. And the ED uh, uh, the ED uh, nurse actually tells you, hey, doctor, the CT scan is back. And I'm going to show it to you now because I, I love pictures. So, Excellent. All right. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Um, Oh, wait, it's starting. Yep. yep, there we go. All right. 
that's one slice of the CT scan. And that is his colon. Okay. All right. Now what? Um, okay. Um, so uh, moving forward, so I'd have the patient um, uh, make sure the patient has adequate IV access uh, as well as an NG tube in place for decompression. I'll you know I'll take a look at the CT to see if the small bowel is dilated or not. Um, uh, will give me an idea of whether the um, has a competent ileocecal valve. Not really. The small bowel looks as small bowels appears normal. You see some thickening and it's kind of maybe a bulkiness that looks up, up like a possible mass in the descending colon. In the descending colon. So um, uh, at this point, you know, I'm obviously concerned for a large bowel obstruction secondary to either a colon mass or um, a malignancy of some sort or a diverticular stricture. Um, he has not had any endoscopic um, uh, workup in the past. Uh, given the dilation, um, the degree of dilation that he has um, in the uh, and uh, on the CT as well as the tenderness on exam, um, uh, I would like to have the patient be taken to the operating room once he's adequately resuscitated. Um, uh, and I'll go ahead and take a look at this mass to see if it's um, resectable, easily resectable or not. Okay. Um, are you going to talk to him about, you know, what type of surgery, a potential ostomy? Because he's kind of freaking out about an ostomy. He says, hey, one of my buddies had an ostomy and I'll never want to live through that ever again. Yeah, and that's completely understandable. Um, so I would talk to the patient and tell him that um, he's definitely going to end up with an ostomy when I take him to the operating room. The type of ostomy he has will most likely be um, determined by what I find in the operating room. If I'm able to resect uh, the mass um, or the site of obstruction, then he will end up with an end colostomy. Um, if there's any other concerning findings, such as metastatic disease, or if I'm not able to resect it safely, um, then I would uh, give him most likely a, a loop uh, colostomy me. At the same time, um, if I'm concerned that his cecum is um, damaged or threatened, um, uh, then he may end up with an end at that point. Okay. So you're going to the operating room. Describe to me his positioning and uh, how you have the room set up. Yeah, so um, I'd have the patient in a lithotomy position, um, and uh, given the distension of his colon, I'll go ahead and do an, um, uh, a midline laparotomy, uh, and then um, and once I'm in the belly, I would go ahead and um, uh, palpate the colon um, all the way to the uh, level of the obstruction um, to see what I'm able to spot. I'd also take a look at the liver as well as the pelvis and the peritoneum to make sure there's no evidence of metastatic disease. All right. So you go in and, you know, you see dilated colon, um, you know, the transverse colon looks healthy and just dilated. You go to the descending colon, you feel this very hard, rock hard mass, uh, pretty adherent to the to the lateral abdominal wall, but you're able to get it freed. Um, and you notice you take a look around the liver and the pelvis, you notice on the left lobe there, you feel something hard. Wasn't seen on the CT scan, but you feel like a two centimeter nodule um, that feels hard. And then you go around the back of the dome of the liver, you feel a couple more small spots as well. Okay, and am I able to, um, I would, if I can, I would go ahead and biopsy that nodule um, with a core biopsy. Okay, you could, you could send it off, but this is nine o'clock at night, pathology is not in-house. Sure, so I'll still go ahead and send it for routine rather than frozen, um, but given the suspicion for metastatic disease, um, I mean, if I'm able to resect the mass, I would still go ahead and resect the sigmoid and give him an end colostomy at that time, um, and if I'm not, then I would do a loop colostomy with the transverse colon. Well, you're you're the you're the surgeon, uh, doctor. What do you want to do? So you said that I was able to tease it off of the abdominal wall. Um, yep. And if, if I'm able to, um, uh, you know, identify the uh, uh, IMA pedicle, um, uh, you know, and and this is in the sigmoid, correct? I just want to clarify. The descending colon. This is like mid descending colon. So mid descending colon. Um, uh, so yeah, the mid descending colon, I'll make sure I can uh, isolate the IMA pedicle and, um, and, uh, I'll go ahead and do a resection. Um, you know, I'll also talk to anesthesia and make sure the patient is stable, uh, and that he can tolerate that resection. Um, and, uh, I'll go ahead and do an end colostomy, you know, I'll make sure that I identify the left ureter, um, so that it is not injured, uh, in any way. Okay. So you're able to get through that. Uh, you do your biopsy, you take the mask out, you bring up an end colostomy, um, you close them up. He does well. Um, Post-operative day three, your 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 you know your PA or your resident gives you a call and says, "Hey, this guy, the ostomy's really not opening up, and now he's really tender in the right lower quadrant." You do yeah. a CBC, not for you, and the white count is twenty-five. 
Okay. So um, obviously my concern is for a sequel perforation um, uh, or, um, uh, you know, uh, ischemia of the cecum um, in the right lower quadrant, given his uh, question. So I want to take you back to the original OR. Would you want to do one other thing or look at something else while you were in there? Yeah, sorry if I I I I I thought I mentioned it, but I did not. But I would definitely make sure and examine the cecum um, to uh, to look at the integrity of the cecum. So you do that, and the cecum looks like this. Yeah, to me that uh, the cecum looks dusky, and there seems to be some cirrhosal injuries as well. Um, uh, so I will go ahead and uh, do an ileocolic uh, resection at that point. Um, uh, as well, and um, uh, you know, ileocolic. You so you're gonna do an anastomosis on this guy? Oh no, no, an ileocolic resection with an end ileostomy. Um, Remember, you're back in the you're back in the original OR. You're back in the first case. Um, I brought you back to the upper room to check out that cecum one more time. Okay, so I'm in the original case, so mm -hmm. I haven't resected his left colon yet. Um, yep. So I would then do, an, uh, given his obstructive nature of the case, um, I would at that point do an ileo, um, resect his cecum, um, terminal ileum, and then give him an endileostomy with the mucus fistula. Okay, all right. All right, good. Now it's not. Now let's say let's say that left that left uh, lobe issue. Let's say the left is the left colon is completely clear. I mean the the left liver and the right side of the liver. The whole liver is clear. There's no signs of metastatic disease. Um, so if there's no signs of metastatic disease, um, uh, then I would uh, go ahead um, do a resection of the uh, end, uh, the left colon, um, give him a left um, uh, end colostomy, uh, and then um, do an ileocolic resection, and I would go ahead do an anastomosis at that point. So anastomosis to end colostomy. colostomy. Okay, all right. If I were to tell you his albumin, well, his albumin coming into the surgery was 1.8, would that change your mind? <laughs> yes, it definitely would be. Um, uh, you know, I would. Uh, um, so uh, at that point, I would go ahead, uh, do the resection on the left. Um, or, I mean, given his, you know, low albumin and everything like that, I think I would just stick with doing an ileocolic resection with an endileostomy and a mucus fistula. And then I would do plan on doing a definitive operation when he's more pre uh, more optimized. Okay. All right. Um, that was pretty good. Okay. When he's out of the operating room, is there any other imaging or any work that you need to finish up for him? Yeah. Given my con uh, concern for malignancy, um, I would go ahead and stage him uh, with a uh, um, you know CT abdomen and pelvis, which is already done. So I'd do a CT chest um, uh, as well as a CEA. Okay. And he tells you he's really upset that that uh, you told him that you left the cancer in. Yeah, um, I mean, I would, I would counsel him, I would talk to him and say, um, you know, I tried my best to not leave it in, but, you know, at the same time, um, I was concerned about his cecum, uh, as well as the complication from uh, his malnourishment. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, um, right now, I wanted to uh, temporize him um, and avoid, uh, you know, abdominal sepsis from a colon perforation. Um, and, uh, you know, the goal would be in the short term to um, go back and, you um, uh, resect the cancer or, okay. you know, depending on, yeah. Yeah. He was reading something online about a subtotal colectomy. Would that have been an option? That would have been an option. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. We'll stop there. Okay. All right. And then, uh, I heard, I saw Dr. Kang is back. Yes. Hey. Dr. King has joined us and is ready for the final scenario to give Dr. Kanagatla a break. I know, poor guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry about that. Lost track of time. To put the no, it's kid, all right, buddy. Run around. I apologize. Don't do that on the real exam. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, let's see. So, second scenario for you, my friend. You have a 47 year old female that comes into the hospital. Um, you've seen her a couple of times before. She's been admitted for diverticulitis in the past, has been treated by her partner, partners non-operatively for non-complicated cases of diverticulitis in the sigmoid colon, never really followed up. And now she presents to the emergency room again with a CT scan showing uh, moderate inflammation to the mid-sigmoid colon, um, no signs of microperforation, no abscesses, no phlegmon, 
White count is 16. The rest of her labs are normal. She doesn't really have any medical history that's pertinent. Her family history is all negative, but she's never had a colonoscopy before and no surgical history. Okay. Um, I would go to the emergency room and examine the patient, uh, make sure uh, I would uh, focus on the vitals and also uh, do an um, abdominal exam. Okay. So abdominal exam, she's mildly tender in the left lower quadrant, um, you know, not rebounding, not, not peritonitic at all. Uh, vital signs are are stable. She's slightly tachycardic, 105, 106, but she tells you she hasn't really eaten or drank anything all day. So how would you proceed? All right. At this time, I think you said the white count was uh, 16,000, but otherwise normal. Um, I would, yep. given her tenderness, um, I would uh, make her MPO. Um, I would start on IV fluids and IV antibiotics and uh, review the scan myself. Um, I would, um, at this time, uh, plan to manage her non-operatively. And um, with the uh, and just do serial ex abdominal exams and serial labs. Okay, good. So we'll see. So uh, I, I didn't hear the diet. What diet would you give her for now? For right now, I would just do MPO with maybe sips of clears and uh, make sure that I do serial abdominal exams. Make sure it doesn't get worse. Okay. Um, you, you do that for about you know 24 hours. You reevaluate her. She you know feels about the same. You know not really better, not really worse. Um, eventually, you know, hospital day three, her white count normalizes. She gets a little bit better to a point where she can tolerate some full liquids, um, but is not is not pain free. Anything you would change? So at this time, uh, with and and her, you said her white count has normalized and her vitals um, have re uh, remained normal. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, at this time it'd be uh, reasonable to, um, if she, as long as she's stable, uh, educate her on a full liquid diet and um, uh, discharge her on full liquid diet, as long as, again, her ab abdominal exam has improved. However, if, uh, if I have any concerns on my physical examination, I would uh, plan to re-image her with the CAT scan. Okay, her physical exam is, you know, better than what, than what you see her. She was really eager, eager to, hold, good to go home. Um, you know, what, what, if, so let's say you send her home, what antibiotics would you give her? Um, I would I would uh, give her something to cover gram negatives and anaerobes, so um, either augmentin or uh, uh, third generation oral uh, cephalosporin. What do you want to send her home with? What I would do you just want dog, to send her I would just with? augmentin. For how long? And I, the dose? I, I would I would do augmentin for um, uh, I would do it for about ten days, and um, I would just do the uh, the BID dosing. I believe it's um, it's either eight twenty five or eight seventy five. Can't quite remember. He's asking you for a number. You're the one writing the script. Yeah, uh, I should know, but I I do not remember. Okay, so you give her the 875 of Augmentin uh, BID for 10 days. She finishes the antibiotics and she calls your office and says, "I'm having the pain all over again. I feel the exact same way as I did last time. I'm heading to the ED." You meet her there. CT scan shows the same thing: moderate to mild inflammation of the mid sigmoid colon, uh, just not getting better. Okay. So ideally, I would have uh, wanted to do a colonoscopy on her about six to eight weeks from this uh, operation. However, um, just uh, based on her clinical presentation, and, um, I would uh, diagnose her with uh, smoldering diverticulitis. Um, I would advise her that, um, again, she has failed uh, non-operative management uh, with uh, just a conservative management. So uh, I would uh, discuss the risks and benefits with her and um, consent her for uh, sigma colectomy, um, but before then, I would make sure that I have nutrition labs and uh, assess whether or not she's been lo losing any weight. Um, no, no that. weight loss. Uh, her albumin is her albumin is four point one. Her prealbumin is sixteen. Okay. Good. Um, yep. Go ahead. All right. So uh, when you said sigma colectomy, she's really freaking out about a potential ostomy bag. Are you talking about an ostomy for her? Yeah. So uh, with her, um, I would discuss with her that. Uh, uh, given her normal nutrition labs and uh, on imaging, um, you know, she's had this smoldering um, diverticulitis. There's always a possibility of an ostomy with any kind of a bowel resection. Uh, but in her case, again, with normal labs and no weight loss um, and high suspicions for uh, smoldering diverticulitis, I would uh, proceed with a minimally invasive sigmoid colectomy with primary anastomosis. How would you describe that? And how would you prepare her for surgery? Um, so uh, actually... I'm sorry, I, I, I'm going to have to backtrack. Uh, unfortunately, because I cannot prep her um, colon, um, uh, I, I don't, 
Yeah. So I don't think she, she'd be able to talk. She, so she's coming in not with unprepped colon. And um, I would uh, discuss with her that uh, if I have any concerns that she would end up with an end colostomy, but that um, I would have uh, plans to reverse her down the road. Okay. I mean, it's only been a week and a half since she left the hospital the last time. She's saying like, is there anything stronger and stronger antibiotics that I can try to avoid surgery at this time? Like, doctor, I would really, I would really love surgery, but I don't want an ostomy bag. I want to get through this. Um, so we could, we could trial uh, Cipro Flagyl, um, uh, but she has been, she, so she has been seen by my, by my partners in the past. Um, she was on IV antibiotics for uh, multiple, with, you know, multiple hospitalizations. And I would discuss that. Yeah, I would love to get you through this and get a, a full colonoscopy on you. Um, but given that you have failed, again, multiple uh, medical management of, of this disease process, uh, I think uh, getting the sigmoid col the disease port part of the colon now would be the best uh, step forward. Okay. She's stable right now. And she says she's willing to, to drink anything. Like she was on full liquids, you know, just a couple of days ago. Okay. Well, in that case, then I would keep her on IV antibiotics and uh, prep her bowel uh, with plans for um, primary resection with primary anastomosis. All right. So she's actually able to take the bowel prep. Um, you know, she's feeling a little bit better, but still tender. And she agrees to surgery. So how would you, how would you set her up for surgery? So in my hands, I would do this robotically. Um, I would uh, place her in lithotomy with both arms tucked with orogastric tube under general anesthesia. I would perform, uh, I would place my uh, robotic ports uh, eight millimeters from left, uh, from the Palmer's point, the left upper quadrant down to the uh, right ASIS. I would place my uh, stapler port in the uh, right lower quadrant. Um, you're, already, you're already in the belly, okay? Yep. So, so you get in there, no, sorry, you get in there and you see the mid sigmoid colon is pretty inflamed. Um, it doesn't feel like a cancer or anything. It looks like diverticulitis, um, but the rest of the sigmoid just looks really inflamed and really beat up. Okay. So, um, uh, I would uh, fully mobilize the sigmoid colon, taking care not to injure the uh, left uh, gonadals or the left ureter, and um, I would uh, I would uh, mob uh, dis I would resect um, distally how, at the rectus. How, how would you identify the left ureter, uh, Dr. Kang? Where where in your dissection? Where are you going to be? I want to I want to know your steps of surgery to okay. get to the point where you're identifying the left ureter. Okay, so um, I would. Initially, start with the medial to lateral dissection at the sacral promontory, um, and uh, I would I, I would lift up the uh, superior rectal um, artery and uh, push down on the um, separate out the retroperineum and uh, identify the ureter that way. If I can't go that way, then um, the ureter can also be identified at the um, the bifurcation of the external and internal iliac arteries. You're trying to look, it's just there's a lot of inflammation. You really can't see the ureter very well. Okay. Um, so if, if medial to lateral doesn't work, then I would go lateral to medial. Not great. It's actually, it actually looks worse. The inflammation on the lateral side is worse. Okay. Um, then I would start with the infra IMB dissection and see if I um, find a more normal plane and track it down that way. This is a you two minute warning. You can't see something that looks like the ureter, but you're still not 100% for sure. All right. Then in that case, um, I would um, I would be concerned that given her chronic nature of diverticulitis, that the ureter may be pulled medially, and I would not feel comfortable just um, uh, going through the mesentery like that. So I would ask the um, I would ask my uh, urology colleagues and come in and um, to see if I can, if they can place a stent. If they're not available, then. Um, yeah, that's what I would do. I would, I would see if a uh, urology can come in and place stents. Sure, actually, uh, your your friendly urologist is actually right next uh, in the, in the next room doing a case. He comes right in and throws in a right and a left stent for you, no problem. And with that, you're able to identify the ureter very well. You're able to move it away. You're able to take your IMA and you do. Now, let's say you've you've done your IMA and you have this big inflamed piece of sigmoid colon. So now, what's the next step? What are are you going to resect and uh, give her an ostomy, or are you going to potentially try to put back together? So um, if there's no gross perforation or, you know, gross, gross infection that would uh, preclude fr uh, from my anastomosis, uh, I would resect distally at the rectal sigmoid junction. I would extracorporealize the colon, feel proximally um, to see uh, which colon, uh, you know, which part of the colon feels healthy and resect there. And I would do a primary anastomosis and do a leak test at the end. Okay. 
All right, you do a leak test, um, you know, patient does well. I'm gonna take you back uh, to when you first see the, 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 the when you're inside the abdomen, you notice that the sigmoid colon, the part that's really inflamed, just one portion of it is stuck to the bladder. And you, and you're dissecting it, you notice it's a colon vesicle fistula. So you take that down and what, 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 how would, what, would that change your surgery at all? Yeah, so um, can I identify the hole in the bladder where I took it down? Yeah, you, you, you see the bladder. It's at the dome of the bladder. You know, you see there's a little bit of hole in the, in the bladder. It's pretty beat up and inflamed. Okay. So I would do a, a I would backfill the bladder, um, see where, exactly where I can see the hole. Um, I would primarily repair that with a uh, 2.0 micro observable suture, and I would leave the Foley in for 10 days and do a cystogram before pulling the Foley. How many layers is that closure going to be? Uh, I mean... I, I could try two layer, but in, in cases like this where things are so inflamed and uh, fistulized, uh, I can I think uh, one layer repair may be sufficient and I could mobilize you know, a piece of momentum and throw it down there as well to try to buttress the repair. All right, good. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll end the torture. Good job. I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm mean with these exams because I don't, they, they can be pretty mean to you. Um, so let me do the, First comment to uh, Dr. Kada Gatla. Yeah, please. Thank you. So, so first, how do you think you did? I always like to ask that. Um, well, because most I, of the time you are your worst enemy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think. I mean, obviously, I messed up on the last part. Definitely with the subtotal, it didn't come to my mind in terms of like that's the option to go to, and um, you know, leaving cancer and obviously never a good thing. Um, but you know that's that's yeah I should have thought of that. I think my your answer period... choice is not bad with the liver being positive. Uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm all I'm always of the mindset, man. I really want it. If if it's that cancer is mobile and you can take it out, yeah, take it out. Right. Um. You know the, your answer would have been good if I told you. Listen, that left colon cancer is stuck to everything. You can't yeah. get it out. You're leaving yeah. pieces of it behind. Then right. yes, absolutely. But I would you know yeah. The subtotal colectomy is definitely a good option. And also with the subtotal colectomy, if the guy, the small bowel is not dilated, you have clean margins, everything looks good, you can put it back together. Sure. Because it's small bowel. It's an ileal sigmoid yeah. resection. It's an ileal rectal. I mean, it's an ileal sigmoid yeah. anastomosis, an ileal rectal anastomosis. And right. you could avoid monotony in that patient. Um, your workup, your, you you worked him up very well. You went stepwise. Got, you know, I gave you the history, but you went through everything because I didn't give you much. I said, he just showed up to the ED because that's what's going to happen. Okay. You identified on the CT that the set that the cecum is very dilated. The key thing is you mentioned it before surgery, right. but in surgery, you said yeah. nothing about checking out the right colon. Yeah. Always, always check the whole colon. And I, I was mean. I even told you the transverse colon looks fine. Okay. I, transverse colon always looks fine. <laughs> the cecum that's going to get you. Uh, and you identified on that picture. That's actually a real intraoperative picture. That's actually one of my cases. Um, and you notice that there's a little, it doesn't look that bad, but when you really look at that picture, there's some dusky portions and you notice the big serosal tear right along the anterior portion. So actually that, that, that case I gave you is similar to a case I had. It was a female. I gave her an ileal sigmoid um, anastomosis. She actually did pretty well. Uh, and thankfully the, the cancer was only a stage two, but it was a big just bulky mass. Um, but no, that was the key thing. Remember, subtotal colectomy is, is an option and it's a very viable option for a, pay, a case like that. But other than that, and then, and then after the procedure, procedure, you got to finish your metastatic workup because that's something happens. Like you rush the guy to the OR and you forget OCT, the chest, CEA, all that stuff. You got to get it. Um, what else? What else? Um, I'm glad that you, you saw with that CT scan, you said, I'm going to the OR. Because then what happens is I give you the patient was, oh, the patient closed in the middle of the night. Now is having severe right lower quadrant pain because now the cecum is probably perfed. Okay. Um, uh, good job. I did that very good job. Okay. Thank you. Thank and you. And then somebody put Justice Philip. Oh, I saw his question and it was a good question. So I'm trying to do an iliorectal and that's with the patient. You, know, you, you do have good concern. He did do a digital rectal exam. The CD scan didn't look too bad. You can always throw a quick flexing up there to the rectum to check it out. Um, definitely, it's something to talk about. And, and definitely, during my case, I did the same thing. All right. All right. But the key, the key principle with that one is, remember your options for a subtotal colectomy. Dr. Kang, how do you think you did? 
And I went, okay. I I, you know, I just kind of panicked because I'm like, man, I, I totally uh, just kind of lost track of time. I'm like hopping on and <laughs> yeah. I don't know. No, it's okay. You're, you're rushed in a situation, but you know, sometimes that happens, man. And, you know, you, you get caught up your situation, your stress level is relatable to, it's like, man, you're thinking about the last question, man, I really messed up that last question. And that brings you down the, the rest of the exam. And it's okay. You can, you can get a question wrong. You can, you can get beat up. You can, you know, not, I don't want to say bomb a question, but you can, you can do poorly on one question and still pass the rest of the exam, okay? Remember, you you know, passing is not 15 out of 15. It's not. So think about that. Just don't get discouraged. Move on. You know, you got to have, amne- you got to have very short-term amnesia. You got to forget about the last question and keep going because that last question is gone. You can't, you know, if it's in another room or another examiner, you can't do anything about it. So, you know, see the patient, work them up every single way. Vital signs, exam, you did well. Um, one thing I, I would say for you is in terms of style, maintain your eye contact. There were some times where you kind of visioned off and moved away from the screen. You can tell you visibly got fr- frustrated when I was trying to poke and prod you a little bit and especially also interrupt you. And they will interrupt you too. Like if when you start talking about putting your ports in for your robotic sigmoidectomy, they, they're going to get you to move on. They want, they know you know how to put in a, a trocars. This isn't the general surgery boards. I'm not examining a second or third year resident. I know you know how to put trocars in. And I know what your your, your trocar position is going to be. I want to know, listen, this is what you see in the operating room. What, what, what do you want to do? And you immediately jumped, okay, I'll do the left ureter. And that's where I kind of wanted to get you. I wanted to see all your steps of identifying a left ureter on a very badly um, inflamed sigmoid. Okay. Um, if I see a nasty sigmoid like that, even if the patient got prepped, I, I'm leaning towards the Hartman's, uh, truth be told. Um, but I, you know, putting back together is not a bad option, especially you have very good margins. The patient tolerated the prep well, and the prep was good. Um, the colovesco fistula, you did a good job. Um, I was trying to get you to throw in like proline or something, which is a no-no with bladder repairs. Um, two layer is always optional. Good job leaving the Foley and do a cystogram uh, seven to 10 days later. That's good. Um, you know, don't go crazy about jumping into partial cystectomies and things like that, because that is only an option when you are concerned about cancer. Granted, I didn't give you a scope patient. You could mention, you know, I would, I would send the specimen off for frozen to make sure this is diverticulitis and not cancer. That's an option I would throw in because this is an unscoped patient. You don't know. 100% certain this is diverticulitis. Okay. All right. So other than that, I thought you did okay, but just a couple things to work on just style. Style-wise, you got through it, but style points are very key to just navigating yourself through the scenario and also saves you a lot of time. All I right, agree. Yeah, Dr. Kang, I would say that um, your stress level is probably very similar to what it will be on the day of exam. Right, like it's just heightened awareness and height, uh, you know, stress level. So, just process all the information, and it's okay to have a short pause before answering the question. Don't feel like you have to jump in the first, you know, thing that comes to your mind. You can definitely use appropriate stalling techniques. I would consider blah blah blah, but my choice ideally would be X, Y, and Z. So that kind of allows you to to be thinking out loud a bit as opposed to um, just saying the one thing that you think, but also going kind of through some other options, um, which if you go down a rabbit hole, kind of lets the examiner bring you back and say, well, okay, well, you know, okay. So he's thinking about these options, but obviously he's chosen option A. So let's bring him back to maybe consider option B or C. So a little bit of, um, you know, external or expression of what you're thinking can help instead of going down um, a rabbit hole and then kind of being too definitive and, and, and secure with your answer. Um, being yeah. able to pivot, I call it. Yeah, and it's always great to give options, but remember at the end of the day, they're gonna ask you and they will, what do you want to do, okay? And I, I do it to my med students and these are med students all the time because I'm trying to prep them because, you know, that that's what's going to happen. It's going to be, you know, what, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. It's like, listen, I, I, I can go shopping at Costco one day and BJ's the next day. You know, you have to make a choice. Um, you know, what do you want to do? You know, surgeon, 
Um, and that's where I want to kind of push you. And same thing, when you're going to give a medical treatment with I really would treat, I've tripped you on the antibiotics. I know that's like step one level type of stuff. They will ask you that. On on my oral board, I had a smoldering diverticulitis. They asked me whatever antibiotic I was going to give. They wanted the dose and the regimen, the days, everything. Okay. Right. So if you didn't, if you didn't, you know, that's something to brush up on because we give these, we give these antibiotics all the time and it's very easy to forget what the doses are. Man, th this could be a little, you know, you know, 50 bed hospital that you're the only surgeon there. There's no PAs, there's no residents, you're filling out everything. So you have to know that stuff. They will, they will catch you on that. And just knowing that bit of information, man, that's a check mark. That's a point. Yeah. Thank you. No, no problem. Okay. It's just something to, to like quick list, you know, quick hit, like, you know, a day, you know, a couple of days before the exam. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys uh, very, very much. This has been excellent. Um, any closing or final thoughts um, from either of our examiners? I know that was a lot of really good food for thought. Uh, 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 Jillian had a thing, decompressing the cecum and reevaluating and proof perfusion. To me, if it's dusky, it's dusky. I, when, when it's been obstructed for that long, especially a big serosal tear like that, I, I, don't, I don't trust that cecum. Because what happens is that you know, I continue on with the scenario, post-op day three, post-op day two, that cecum perfs. And now you're in big trouble. And then, yeah, would you consider aleocecectomy and end ileostomy with the mucus fistula? I would if it was the type of cancer that we described before, big, bulky mass, could not get out. It, like, just stuck. But if you can get the cancer out, typical rule of thumb is get it out. All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it and for uh, humoring all of our questions. And thanks to our examinees for um, letting us publicly torture you a little bit for hey, everyone's this, benefit. This is the this is the best practice you can get. Okay. I mean, like, all right, kudos to you guys. Okay. It's really, really. It one. It takes a lot of courage and you know confidence to just come on here and just be examined. Um, you know, in front of, you know, everybody, okay? And this is live and recorded so people can see it again and again, <laughs> okay? Awesome. All right, everybody. Don't forget to uh, go to our website, uh, CRS Virtual Education, and uh, sign up to our listserv to get notifications about uh, future recordings like this one. Thanks, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thank you so much. Great, for great luck, guys, whoever's taking it. And for, for the next year, Applicants start. This is how this is how you do it. Start practicing Zoom over the phone. This is how you get. This is how you 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 crush this exam. It really is. All right. Good luck to all of you.